the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we invoke once again your Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that inspired St. Luke to write this gospel, to now come and be our teacher, our leader, our guide as we delve into the scriptures in hopes of encountering your Son, Jesus Christ, especially in this holy season, Lord. Deepen our understanding. And as we begin the new liturgical year where we'll be reading the gospel of Luke pretty much every week, I pray, Lord, that our study of the gospel will enliven and enrich, deepen our appreciation for the liturgy and let our, our uh, celebration of the Eucharist and Mass just be uh, better than ever. And let this year be a year of discovery and intimacy with you and the, the beautiful life you've called us to share with you. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So... Where did we get to last week? Chapter 19. That's right. So Jesus has traveled from Galilee all the way to uh, Jerusalem now. And he has entered the holy city. Has he not? Yes. So we had that. We had Jesus topping the Mount of Olives coming from Bethany and Bethphage. Very prophetically getting a donkey, a colt. And then riding into town that way. Not because he was suddenly tired of walking. But because he knew the prophetic significance of that acted out parable. Which Jesus does a lot. And he's going to do, we're going to see several more of those. Probably even today. Uh, and, but it's like I said last week. We have to work a little bit harder of seeing the parabolic significance of some of these actions. Uh, for two reasons. One is that we don't know the scriptures that it automatically links the Jewish audience to the, what we call the Old Testament that they were educated in. We don't automatically think of that from Isaiah or Jeremiah or wherever it was, right? And the other is that, and it's not our fault, it's not that they're smarter than we are, we are trained to have a mathematical thinking process. We look at the world through the lens of rationalism, which is what you see is what you get, right? Right? Uh, they had a different way. I mean, it was not as hard for them to see or to imagine that historical events had supernatural significance. It, that they, they impacted... The spiritual world was as real to them as the natural world. There was no doubt in their mind, not because they were religious, but because they just thought they, were, they had a brain. I mean, Aristotle thought the same way. And he was no Christian or Jew, but I mean... To him, it was, it was absolutely there was a spiritual realm going on. He just thought that was a product of logical thinking, you know, intelligence. And so looking for the significance about how natural events had supernatural significance or things that happened at a certain place and in time had a certain timelessness to it and learn the lesson was easier for them because just, just, it was just their worldview. So that's a little harder for us to. Some of you are more mystical than the rest of us and maybe it's easier. But most of us have to work a little bit at that. And we have to stop and we have to try to make the connection, which is pretty obvious in the scriptures when you begin to understand what the scriptures are trying to say. Larry, we need a microphone for Larry. I can speak loud. Just yell. Where'd George go? Okay. Uh, in line with what you're saying, one thing I wanted to point out was in, verse, in, in chapter 19, verse uh, 30, where Jesus said, go into the village... Opposite you, and as you enter, you will find a coat, a colt, tethered on which no one has ever sat. Right. Think about the, the spiritual significance of that, that no one has ever sat. You know, when Moses came upon the burning bush, the Lord says to him, take off your sandals for you are on holy ground. Right. So it was a preparation for him to come into the presence of God. Jesus coming to earth through a virgin, it was a preparation of coming through holy ground. And yet here we have a cult to carry him. It's in preparation for his... Something new. Something, something new. And this, this, so that ground, you know, when Jesus is buried, Luke, for instance, is going to make a note to us that he's put into a tomb that had never been used before. I mean, these tombs, you know, multiple people could be buried in them. Uh, but it was one, newly hewn and no one. So from the virginal womb to the, to the tomb 
to everything in between. And it's supposed to signify to us that Jesus encountering anything makes it new and sacred and set apart. I wonder if this cult was revered by the Christians after this time. I don't know. I've never actually thought about the cult until you mentioned that. So but thank you for pointing that out. So that's right. That's one of those little nuggets that you look at. And even if you don't know exactly what to do with it, it makes you contemplate the genius of God a little bit more, right? Okay. But we looked at all that. How Solomon, when he was inaugurated king, is that the right, coronated, he rode into Jerusalem just like this. All right, so, so for them, seeing Jesus on this cult, everybody broke out into the, the, the right song of Psalm 118, and they thought of 1 Kings and the whole event. We looked at that a little bit. So, so they made the connection because without Jesus saying a word, there was parabolic significance. And the chief priests and the scribes saw it too. That's why they told him, you need to tell them to be quiet. They're making too big a deal of you here. I mean, we're bordering on blasphemy, right? Even though Jesus himself hasn't said anything he could be accused of, just by doing it that way, and probably smartly he did it, he pronounced himself this way without using words, but they saw the significance. And then he said, I, you know, I can't tell them to stop. They understand the historical significance of this moment in the plan of God. It said, even the stones would cry out. All right. Then, in sort of a, 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 a prequel to a longer section in chapter 21, then he has the lament for Jerusalem, where he shed tears over it. And I told you, on the Mount of Olives, halfway down, there's a church there called Dominus Flevit. The Lord wept. And that's where he stood there, and he looked at, at the temple, and he, and he cried over it. And he gave a little bit of the, the prophecy that he will explain more in another chapter about looking at it, it's beautiful and he loves the people there, but he knows they're going to be destroyed soon. Which is a big theme in Luke, okay? Remember, Jesus coming to Jerusalem is to pronounce a great day of the Lord, which means mercy for those who will make half a move in his direction, but judgment for those who won't because the, the sand has run out of the hourglass and it's the time of, of decision and it's not going to be good for those that won't accept the Lord. Now we have the expulsion of the dealers from the temple. Verse 45. He went into the temple and began driving out those who were busy trading, saying to them, according to Scripture, <laughs> my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a bandit's den. One sentence in Luke, and I'm very surprised. Much longer in Mark, and maybe you remember us talking more about this, right? I'm surprised because the bigger context to this, which we can discover if we look at Jeremiah 7, 11, which Jesus, which Jesus is quoting right here, uh, has the deeper context adds a lot to the thesis of Luke. I mean, Luke's one of his big themes is that the gospel, he, Luke the Gentile, has learned from Paul that this church, this kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing is for everyone. The universality of it is a big deal to Luke. Right, And he's brought it out all through his gospel. And he has an opportunity to do that here. Maybe I shouldn't even say this out loud. Luke includes the story, but I wonder if he understood the significance of the event. Because otherwise it seems to me he would have made a big deal of it. But he does it. But let, let's look at Jeremiah. I mean, we have this text here that again would have had lots of sacramental significance to people that know the scriptures. But these are not scriptures, we know that well. So can, if you just put your finger there, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 7. And if you don't have Old Testament here, I'll help you with it. So who's Jeremiah? What's the context? Jeremiah is a prophet that's not liked. Because he's in Jerusalem... And he's saying Nebuchadnezzar is coming. Nebuchadnezzar, is, I was told is the right way to say it. The Babylonians are coming. And the false prophets were, go, were saying, don't worry. We're safe here because God's temple is here. God's temple is here. God's house is here. God has made this the holiest place on the planet. And no pagan army is going to be able to destroy it. God himself will fight for us. And we will survive. We will exterminate these Gentile 
you know, blasphemers when they get here. But they're the false prophets. But they're the ones they wanted to hear. <laughs> Jeremiah alone was the one saying, no, nope, that's not going to happen. This is the time of judgment. And the judgment is that your faithlessness requires God's punishment. And this place is going to be destroyed. Okay? Let me just read a few excerpts from 7. Jeremiah is saying, amend your behavior and, act, and your actions. He's quoting God now. He's speaking for God as a prophet. And I will let you stay in this place. Do not put your faith in delusive words such as this is Yahweh's sanctuary. He says in verse 6, do not exploit the stranger. I want you to keep that in mind because that's relevant to the cleansing of the temple. All right? He says, he said, now we are safe to go on doing all these loathsome things. Do you look at this temple that bears my name as a den of bandits? Jesus says that. He quotes that line, right? I, at any rate, can see straight, Yahweh declares. Then he says, Jeremiah says this in the name of God. Now go to the place which used to be mine at Shiloh. That's where they kept the Ark of the Covenant before they brought it to Jerusalem. And Shiloh is now wasted. It's destroyed. Go, go, go to the place which used to be mine at Sh Shiloh. He says in verse 14, I shall treat this temple that bears my name in which you put your heart, the place that I gave you and your ancestors, just as I treated Shiloh. Okay? That's just a few snippets. So you get the idea. But in Jesus and say, quoting that line, he automatically, like a laser beam, shot them back to the prophecy of Jeremiah where he himself is saying, don't have the false sense of security that you are safe because you're in this temple. God, God has once before destroyed this place and it can happen again. All right, now, and remember the bit about mistreating the stranger. All right, so we know from Mark, I'll just refresh your memory. The temple mount had the, uh, the temple on it. All right, and the, the central holiest part was the Holy of Holies. That's where God dwelt. It's where the Ark of the Covenant used to be, even though it's been missing now at the time of Jesus for hundreds of years. It never has turned back up, except in Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> so that's the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest could go in there once a year. The next, what they call portico or, or, or porch, and each one is separated by a barrier, was where the priests operated, and they offered the showbread, and they kept the incense going, and that kind of stuff, all right? Only the priest could go there. The next zone out was where the Jewish men could come and pray. The next zone out was where the Jewish women could come and pray. And the last zone, still on the Temple Mount, but the furthest away from God as you could get, was the portico of the Gentiles. So the Gentiles were welcome to come by God's design. I don't know how welcome they were in actuality, right? But God said they need to have a place the righteous Gentiles can come and pray to the God of the Jews, but they need to stay way out there, all right? But they did have a place on the Temple Mount. And we know from history, the priests allowed the commerce that was kind of necessary to take place there in the Gentiles' court, right? I say necessary because uh, everywhere else in the Holy Land, the coin was the denarius, the Roman coin. And it was not allowed to be used to make offerings at the temple because it had the image of Caesar on it. All right? So you had to change it into temple coins, temple currency, which wasn't useful anywhere else. <laughs> so you didn't walk around with a pocket of temple money because it was useless to you. But when you came to the temple, you had to exchange your currency Okay? And if there's anything like at the airport now, if you've ever exchanged money, there's probably a lot of graft and corruption going on. <laughs> All right, so there was that. Also, people made animal sacrifices. Bulls, if you were rich, or lambs, or turtle doves, pigeons, right? But if you came from Galilee or somewhere far off, you don't want to drag your critters all the way with you, right? You just come and then buy it when you got to Jerusalem. 
So there were people out there selling these animals too. So you can imagine the clinking of money, the smells, the sounds of the animals, and everything. It really wasn't that conducive for prayer. Now a lot of people, our rational mathematical uh, mind would look at this and we think, oh, well, he got there and he calls them a, a, band of, a den of bandits. It's because they were cheating everyone. And maybe they were. But when we look at the context that we just looked at in the Old Testament, the deeper context is that they were mistreating, they were, they, they were, they were being disrespectful to the Gentiles who also were in, invited to come and pray. So Jesus gets mad because, I mean, how hard would it be to pray? He came up on this place and there's cows mooing and sheep bleeding and doing what animals do everywhere and clanking of chains and people arguing about the exchange rate. You came to pray. And I think that's what made Jesus angry. All right? Because even if the exchange rates had been fair, and maybe they were, maybe they weren't, that was not allowing it to be a house of prayer. Okay? And that, that's why I said I'm surprised Luke didn't make a bigger deal of this disrespect to the Gentiles, but maybe he didn't know it. Maybe when he got to heaven, he saw that and he says, man, I could have I really... I'd have added two more chapters to my gospel. I don't know. I, maybe, I don't mean to be disrespectful to St. Luke, but I mean, it just, it just, I don't understand why he didn't do more with it because it was just right in his wheelhouse, right? Okay. Yes? He actually does a little bit more earlier in 19 when he gives the parable of the 10 gold coins. Yeah. Oh, actually, oh. that's a prelude to this. It is a prelude. Yeah. That's why. And you know, I told you last week, we really know we're getting it when we do Bible studies like this we're not just listening to Bible stories and talking about what does this mean to me today but we, when, we're, when we're doing Bible studies and we begin to sort of anticipate and then when we read the next section it makes sense according to what we just read or then we realize oh that's why he said that like you just did I'm just saying that was a great setup to a much deeper exegesis of the cleansing of the temple right because he didn't, he wasn't, it wasn't dirty. He wasn't sweeping it or anything. He was cleansing it of the unholiness that they had brought into it. Right? So, yes, I agree, I agree with you. All right. We're going to move on. Chapter 20. One day while he was teaching the people in the temple, proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and scribes, which have been mostly Pharisees, together with the elders, spoke to him. We're going to see several of these encounters where they're all trying to, in their own way, find some way to trip Jesus up and get him in trouble. This is where they say, what authority have you for acting like this? Jesus is not quite ready to openly say it, so he says, I'll ask you a question if you answer it, I'll answer yours. So he says, was John the Baptist legit or not? And they get perplexed because they say, if we say no, the people will be mad at us because they all like John the Baptist. If we said yes, he was legit and from God, they'll say, he'll say, well, why didn't you follow him? So they say, we don't know. And he says, then I don't have to answer you either. And then he goes right into, now remember, the scribes, I said that, not because of the lesson, but I want you to understand in, this, in Luke's story, at the ne very next section, the scribes and the Pharisees are still standing there. Okay. And he went on to tell the people this parable. So he's talking to, I don't want to make anybody a scribe and a Pharisee. So he's, he's talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. He has this sort of little useless exchange with them. And then he turns around and talks to the people. Went on to tell them this parable. A man planted a vineyard and leased it to tenants and went abroad for a long while. When the right time came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get his share of the produce of the vineyard. To them, a vineyard Isaiah, and in so many places in the Old Scripture, uh, the people of God are referred to as God's vineyard. All right, So they're already thinking vineyard. He, cho he, cho he chose a vineyard instead of a cotton field for good reason. <laughs> but the tenants thrashed him and sent him away empty-handed. But he went on to send a second servant. They thrashed him too and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. He still went on to send a third. They wounded this one too and, th and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard thought, what am I to do? I will send them my own beloved son. 
Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they put their heads together saying, this is the heir. For some reason they thought, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. That's some stinking thinking, isn't it? So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. But that helps Jesus make this point. Now what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and make an end of these tenants and give the vineyard to others. Hearing this, they said, God forbid. He said, but he looked hard at them. I bet when Jesus looked hard at you, it was, he looked hard at them. Anyway, they understood what he was talking about, all right? He didn't have to explain it. The vineyard is God's people. The people left in charge are these elders and priests. They're supposed to be tending the vineyard for God. And instead, they're, they're using it for the self-aggrandizement, all right? The self-enrichment. And he's been sending prophet after prophet after prophet, trying to call them back to the true task at hand. And finally, he sends his own son. And if they were making the connection, they'd begin to realize, well, who's the son? All right? And then they kill him, which, he's, of course, Jesus will be dead in a few days. And he says, because of all that, they're sealing their fate. Their fate. All right? Not all of the people. It's critical of the leaders, because they didn't understand leaders in the kingdom of God makes you a servant of the people, of those you're called to serve, not better than everyone else. And they got that wrong, especially the Pharisees. They began to think we're doing it better than everyone else, therefore God likes us the best and we deserve a special place in society. He looks hard at them. He says, they say God forbid. He says the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's Psalm 118. And it's just like when Ezra rebuilt the second temple. The cornerstone, that's the first stone that's laid and all the others are basically built on top of that. He said, you can either accept it as the cornerstone, otherwise it will crush you. Anyone who falls on that stone will be dashed to pieces. Anyone it falls on will be crushed. The scribes and the chief priests would have liked to lay hands on him at that very moment because they realized that this parable was aimed at them. Which it was. But they were afraid of the people. All right. The next little section is Caesar's coin, which you know. They try to trick him into saying you don't have to pay taxes to the Romans. Uh, figuring if he says you don't have to do it, they'll just go tell the Romans what he just said. Or if he says you should pay taxes to the Romans, and that would discredit him a little bit in the eyes of the people who don't like the Romans. But he says, he takes the coin, he says, whose image is on it? They said Caesar's, that's the denarius. He said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. And that shuts them up. They were unable to catch him out in anything he had to say in public. They were amazed at his answer and were silenced. Now we get to a section that I would like to jump over, but Sylvia asked me not to. Right. No, I would have done it anyway. But it is a little tricky. I don't think it was that tricky to them originally in a different culture, but in, to us, we actually, I think, miss the point entirely and start thinking about something else. Let me read it through. Now come the Sadducees. It's the Sadducees' turn. The Sadducees were a different party from the Pharisees. All right? Sadducees were ma mainly priests, Levites. They had a little different theology than Pharisees. For one thing, they didn't believe in an, an immortal soul. They thought the soul and the body ended at death. Okay? No afterlife. They also didn't, of course, then believe in the resurrection. And they didn't believe in angels. The Pharisees believed in all three. So here come the Sadducees with their theology. Some Sadducees, those who argue that there is no resurrection, approached him and put this question to him. Whether it's hypothetical or real situation, I don't know. But this is going to be a question they figure he just can't answer if he believes in an afterlife. Master, Moses prescribed for us, if a man, man's married brother dies childless, the man must marry the widow to raise up children for his brother. Just leave that there and let's move on. Well then, there were seven brothers. 
The first, having married a wife, died childless. The second, and then the third married the widow, and the same with all seven. They all died leaving no children. Man, if I was brother six or seven, I'd be, I, I'd be, I'd be hoping somebody had a child because the black widow is wiping us out. Right. <laughs> all right, so in this situation, all seven brothers do their duty according to the law of Moses, try to have a, a child for their brother and their other brothers, I guess, so his legacy could go on and they all die. Now their silly question. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will she be? Since she has been married to all seven. Alright. Jesus replied, The children of this world take wives and husbands, but those who are judged worthy of a place in the other world and in the resurrection from the dead do not marry because they can no longer die. For they are the same as angels being children of the resurrection. So, all right. I know what you're thinking right now, but let's go back to the context here. He's just, a, these people who do not believe in the afterlife, the resurrection, or angels, he's just told them in the one line, there is an afterlife, there is a resurrection, and there are angels. All right? That's actually the point there. But we've got more questions. He said and he, he, they don't marry in the next life. He goes on and says they, they are children of God. And Moses himself implies that the dead rise again in the passage about... Remember, he's, he's concerned with their question about the resurrection. In the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead but of the living. For to him everyone is alive. Some scribes then spoke up and they said, well put, Master. Okay, the Pharisees liked his answer for once. He sided with them, right? Now he's their boy. Go, Jesus. We're going to hate everything else you say, but you put it to the Sadducees. There you go. So they did not dare to ask him any more questions, the Sadducees. Okay, first of all, I'd like to point out to you, in a way, he doesn't answer their question. Well, He says in the next life, people don't get married. That's what he said. He doesn't really speak to the question of what happens if you were married in the first life. He just says in the next life, people don't take husbands and wives. Marriage is an institution. God is holy and is from God, but he instituted it at the Garden of Eden for, for a couple of important purposes, but they're earthbound. One is, for a mortal race, we have to procreate. Right? He says they do not marry because they no longer die. If people are not dying, if the population is not going down, there's no reason to procreate. Okay? So he instituted marriage and gave people a sex drive where it could be properly exercise and make children, okay? I know we think of marriage as being much more than just making children, but that's part of the original plan, right? The other part, and it's also in Genesis, is God made, uh, this is going to sound patristic, but in the, in the narrative context, he wanted to give Adam a helpmate, and he wanted to give Eve a protector and a provider. They completed each other. The man and the woman in their roles by themselves were not complete. So another part of marriage was to complete the individuals. Okay? For, for the life we live on this planet. In the next life when we're perfected, that necessity is not there. Either. Okay? So he says that. Now, now let me just speak to the elephant in the room. George? George? You're trying to help me out? George the You're not the elephant, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is the, they take one thing with them, which is the kingdom of love. It's when they love each other. It's a total sacrifice. Absolutely. The sacrifice that we give to our beloved. Right. It's not only give and take, it's just give yourself. Right. Well, thank you, because you're anticipating what I was going to, what I, I was actually going to say. 
Because some people would say, I mean, some, to some people who maybe have not been in a happy marriage, the idea that I'm not going to be married in the afterlife, then maybe that's good news. <laughs> maybe you think you're going to start dating again. I don't know. That's not it either. But, but if, you, if you've been in a happy marriage in this life, and even though it was till death do you part, that was part of the vow, right? You're thinking, well, in the next life, is this just going to be another random soul? Of course not. We'll love everyone, but not everyone the same. Your children, your husband, your wife have now and always will have a special place and a special relationship. There's an intimacy and a history there that cannot be just obliterated. In the next life, we're not just holy zombies walking around. We still have, you know, robotic beings or something. We have wills, we have emotions, we have memories, you know, we have experienced joy, all, the whole bit, but it's all perfected. So we'll be able to love even more, not less, even more the people that we love now. And we'll be able to love those we have trouble loving now. We'll be the perfected version of ourself, okay, in the resurrection. And after the resurrection, that includes physically. Okay? But even before that, spiritually, we're, we're perfected. Yes, go ahead. It's just a question because my people are mostly sitting, but if I cheat on my wife, I hurt the spirit. Yes? If you cheat on your wife, you hurt your, her spirit? Yeah. You, you're, you're physically, she doesn't know. Okay? But oh. Yeah. And when she finds out, you're going to be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> physically, spiritually, and every other way. Of course, uh, of, of course. Look, God said, well, Paul said, marriage, the institution of marriage is the closest parable on earth to a relationship God has with his people, the church, okay? The, he, he says the church is my body. Why are you persecuting me, the body of Christ? We say when in the, in the sacrament of marriage, the two become one, two indiv individuals, but not, not like they were before. In a way, you now have two lives that are mingled. And everything you do influences your wife, for good or for bad. Everything she does affects your life, for good or for bad. This is the choice you made at marriage, and God blessed it and made it a covenant relationship where now two lives are being shared. All right? Now, the exact relationship ends at death. But the bond, I don't think, is, is separated by death, all right? There is something. So I don't know if that answers your question or I just made a mess of it. My point was that the questions that we bring into this aren't even the ones they asked or the ones that Jesus answered. <laughs> they had a different bag of issues here. Uh, but we do, have, we do have a question then about, you know, maybe for them the thought that at, at death people are not married anymore wasn't a problem. I mean, because you... Well, we say too. I mean, you're welcome to remarry after your spouse dies. Don't do it before then. <laughs> or you get into your problem, right? So, but we say that. But uh, emotionally, that hurts us. It makes us sad a little bit, too. And so I, I just don't think you're going to... I think in reality, you're not going to find that to be the case. By the way... Should I even mention this? Back when I used to work with the youth a lot more and you'd have these breakout sessions, the boys and the girls, a lot of times, well, I never had one with the girls. Maybe they asked the same kind of questions, but the boys would also ask, so in heaven, <laughs> and I'd say, no, and they took that as very bad news. <laughs> I said, but don't choose hell because it's not allowed there either. <laughs> and for me telling them that in the perfected version of yourself, you won't have that need. That the joy, the pleasure, the, the beauty of it, <laughs> if that's what they're looking for, <laughs> that would be what they're looking for in the perfected version. And you already have that, okay? Right. So... Uh, Anyway, that's just, it's just always funny. You can almost see it coming. Their little eyes are clicking and their hormones are raging. And they're going, wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. 
<laughs> All right. So questions about that? It's the best I can do with it. Okay. Um, just to underline or put a highlighter on a point we've already made about Jesus' criticism is not really of all the people. It's about the leaders primarily. And he's trying to invoke the people to stop following them because they're leading them astray. And we just had that parable about the caretakers using the vineyard for themselves instead of taking care of it like they're supposed to. Uh, so verse 45, while all the people were listening, he said to the disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love to be greeted respectfully in the market squares to take the front seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets who devour the property of widows or, show, or for show offer long prayers the more severe will be the sentence they receive. He's sort of said that thing many times already. I think it's interesting, uh, after he tells us the parable on the tenant farmers, uh, then the scribes and the chief priests back in verse 19 says, sought to lay their hands on him at that very hour, but they feared the people. Right. For they knew that he had addressed this parable to them. How can you be a leader, a loving leader, if you fear the people you lead? Well, I think you just answered your own question by adding that adjective. They weren't loving the people that they were supposed to be taking care of. They were using their position and using the people. We know from history, for one thing, they changed uh, a law so that the temple could take the take the property of a man who died instead of leaving it to the widow. That's what he's talking about, devouring the property of widows. Uh, or allowing someone to, a man to not take care of his parents because he devotes this money. He says, when I die, I'm going to give this money to the, the temple. Therefore, I don't have to take care of my parents now. And so, you know, it was just ways of getting around what was clearly the law of God. So they were making laws and traditions that were self-serving. Right. All right. So that's what he's specifically talking to. Isn't that one of the main reasons they were against him? Not, not because he claimed to be who he was, but because they were undermining their uh, yeah, of course. livelihood. Well, just like John the Baptist who called him a brood of vipers. Yeah. Uh, you know, they came, but they didn't want to get baptized. They just wanted to observe what this what this nut farm was doing out here in the desert, you know, and all these people were coming out there, but they looked at his popularity as a threat to them, all right? They, they wanted that attention and that loyalty. I mean, thousands of people running out to throw palm branches in front of Jesus, they didn't do that when they came to town, no. right? So there was a certain uh, popularity factor there that they were not very easy with, right? And he was speaking harsh things about them specifically. For all they knew, at one point he was going to say, Grab the, grab the Pharisees and scribes and let's throw them all in jail. Let's have an uprising. Let's do this thing better. Make Israel great again. Drain the swamp or whatever. But, but remember, he does uh, in the parable say he will come and put those ten farmers to death. And yeah. Over the vineyard. That's pretty harsh language, right? So, right. He did that for him. He wasn't sugarcoating it. All right, so now all of that is going to lead up to a really specific section here in chapter 21. The discourse on the destruction of Jerusalem. Mark has it uh, in chapter 13. Matthew has it in chapter 24. Luke is chapter 21. I think it's Matthew that has him standing on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem when he gives this prophecy. So it's usually called the Olivet Discourse. Now it's significant, but it does... I hope you'll say it makes sense according to the theme of Luke when I tell you that this, this prophecy of Jesus is the longest section in Luke. Luke has been hitting fast and moving on. Remember, we've been reading, reading these really short things. Here he says, uh, uh, this is the longest discourse in Luke. And a lot of people get worked up about this because they say it's hard to understand. I'm going to go through it bite by bite, and I think it's less difficult. Not, not that we're going to understand everything, but I think it'll be less difficult 
than we assume. And let me just tell you ahead of time, part of the problem is some people like to ascribe this all to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Some people like to say, no, it has not, a lot of people don't even know the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So they assume that it all has to do with the end of the world. All right, so Hal Lindsey and uh, Tim LaHaye, they get a lot of mileage out of these things, right? All right, we won't have to deal with that much, I guess, until the end of the 21st century, and then it'll churn back up again. But anyway, so this is what he says. Some were talking about the temple, remarking how it was adorned with fine stonework and votive offerings. And he said, all these things you are staring at now, the time will come when not a single stone will be left on another. Everything will be destroyed. He might say, well, that's a little Middle Eastern hyperbole there, but we know from history that's exactly what happened in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD that they completely dismantled the thing, uh, the buildings at least. All that was left was that retaining wall around the temple mount. It's going to be literally fulfilled. He says, but he said, take care not to be deceived because many will come using my name and saying, I am the one, and the time is near at hand. Refuse to join them. Now we know from historians, Eusebius, a Christian historian, and Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, that in this time of Jesus, where there was a lot of messianic expectancy, and after the time of Jesus, a lot of people did say, I'm the Messiah. Some of them had some brief success. You know, had some gatherers. They, they gathered some followers, etc. So that, that is going to happen. Because Jesus, I think Jesus now, specifically I'm talking about the destruction of the temple. He set that up with the first part. But he's saying, but before that happens, don't be deceived. Many are going to come saying, I'm the one. The time is near at hand. So it's going to be some time yet. Refuse to join them. And when you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be terrified, for this is something that must happen first. There's going to be a Jewish uprising. That's going to actually, several of them. And then there's going to be one, one successful one in early 60s AD where they actually kick the Romans out. That's what provoked uh, Titus and the Roman legions to come back and teach them a lesson. That's what led to the destruction of the nation and of the temple. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be terrified, for this is something that must happen first, but the end will not come at once. Then he said to them, nation will fight against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes and plagues and famines in various places. There will be terrifying events and great signs from heaven. But before all this happens, you will be seized and persecuted. You will be handed over to the synagogues and to imprisonment and brought before kings and governors for the sake of my name. And that will be your opportunity to bear witness. We know the story of the early Christians, right? All that is exactly what happened to this first generation and beyond. Make up your minds not to prepare your defense because I myself will give you an eloquence and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, and friends, and some of you will be put to death. That literally all happened. You will be hated universally on account of my name. A great persecution will break out in the entire empire, you know. But not a hair of your head will be lost, or at least lost eternally. Your persever perseverance will win your lives, at least your eternal life. I think he's still talking about... Now, it, it, you can't exactly separate the destruction of the temple and the end of the world because the, the events are conflated. This, maybe more than anything we've seen so far, the destruction of the temple had huge sacramental significance. I mean, historically. For the Jews, the destruction of the temple would have spoken volumes without saying the world, a word that the world as we know it is over. As we know it, at least, it's over. You can't practice Judaism the way they had always done it up to now without Jerusalem and without a temple. With that happening, and, they, and we know from, uh, if you, you can go check out uh, Antiquity of the, no, the Jewish Wars by Flavius Josephus, and you can read about the account because when Titus first destroyed the towns of Galilee, the leader was Josephus. 
and uh, he quickly ran through them, the leader of the, of the, the, the uh, Jewish patriots, <laughs> all right, that were trying to defend the place. They fell quickly, and, but, and most of them were killed, but, but Josephus was a learned man, and Titus decided to make him his personal historian. I want you to record for history my glorious campaign here. And, uh, and he did. And so we have that. And Titus eventually became, uh, they made him uh, emperor because of his success here. All right, so we know this. So he says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you must realize that it will soon be laid desolate. Then those in Judea must escape to the mountains. Those inside the city must leave it. Those in country districts must not take refuge in it. For this is the time of retribution, when all that Scripture says must be fulfilled, in which all he has been saying will be fulfilled. Alas, for those with child or with the babies at breast when those days come, because you need to run. All right, now Eusebius records for us that the early Jewish Christians still living in Israel knew this prophecy. They took it literally, all right? And that when they saw the Romans invading and coming to Jerusalem, most of the population was heading to Jerusalem, the fortress city, that just like in the time of Jeremiah, they figured because the temple's there, God will protect it. They can't take it. That's why Jesus has been trying to give them that bandit's den connection, the whole bit. Says, no, it's the time of punishment and destruction. Right? It's going to be the end of age, end of the world as you know it. Well, the loyal Jews were heading to Jerusalem thinking that that will be the holdout and they'll be saved. The Jewish Christians, Eusebius tells us, took this prophecy literally and when the invasion came, they left. They went to what we call Jordan now, to mountains in a place called Pella. And they stayed there for years and were saved. The destruction. Eusebius tells us that over a million Jews were killed. The siege of Jerusalem took over a year. It was hideous. The suffering, the starvation, even cannibalism, the, the revolts, the, when they tried to es escape what they did for the woes that they caught, right? Um, it was hideous. But the Christians, Eusebius tells us, who took this literally were spared because they understood it was not going to turn out well, and they left. But you can understand, all right, let's just think of this as real people. You're a Christian Jew. Other people in your family are not believers in Jesus as the Messiah. And here come the Romans. And they're saying, let's go to, let's go to Jerusalem, get safe. And you're saying, no. And they say, well, you're just going to turn your back? Are you a traitor? Are you a turncoat? And they said, no, mom, you need to come with me. Sister, you need to come with me. You're going to get killed if you go there. Jesus said it. You know, we've, we've, been, we've been holding on to this prophecy for decades now. And it's coming. He said, when the armies come in, we see Jerusalem's going to be surrounded. That's going to be the destruction. It's not going to be the crowning moment when Messiah is going to come. He's already come. You can imagine the conflict in these families. The crying, the weeping, the cursing. Just, just put yourself there. That's why he says, there'll be two in bed or two at the threshing mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Families are going to be split up. Friends are going to be split up. Villages are going to be split up. And those running away are not going to be probably thought of as very kindly by the patriots who are going to stay. Okay, I just want you to see that. I think now he's shifting gears. He is now, I think, talking a little bit more about the end of time. Because he says, for great misery will descend on the land and retribution on this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive to every Gentile country. Well, we know that, oh, what did Eusebius tell us? I think 90,000 captives were led away as slaves to be either as slaves or to be used as entertainment in the Colosseums and that kind of stuff. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive to every Gentile country and Jerusalem will be trampled down by the Gentiles until their time is complete. All right, so what he just said there in a couple of words is pretty significant. He's saying that moment, which he says another place will happen before this generation is gone, a generation is 40 years. 
He says that in 30 AD. In 70 AD, and by the way, he says it at, this is Passover week, and Flavius Josephus says that the Roman army showed up at Passover 40 weeks, 40 years to the week. It happens, okay? But the events are conflated. For one thing, in a way that we also don't understand, the Jews realized that God told Moses to set up the temple with a specific pattern because it was a prototype, a microcosmos of the way the whole world, in fact, the whole universe was set up. God in the center and then everything else out from that. So in a way, the temple is a model of the world. The destruction of the temple would have spoken very prophetically, parabolically, about the end of the world. And that's why I think these two events are so conflated. And it, you know, the previous destructions of the temple anticipated the destruction in 70 AD, but the destruction in 70 AD anticipates the ultimate uh, end, which is going to be the second coming. And that's why they're so linked. When it talks about the hair, even the, was it, uh, even the hair or the head will not be disturbed. Yeah. Um, Luke reports to us earlier in chapter 12 what he means by that courage under persecution. And he says, be a, uh, I shall show you who to fear. Be afraid of the one who, after killing, has the power to cast into Gehenna. Yes, I tell you, be afraid of that are not five sparrows sold for two small coins, yet not one of them has escaped the notice of God. But even the hairs of your head have all been counted. Do not be afraid. You are worth more than these sparrows. I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. That's what he, he's talking about, the courage to us during this right. kind of persecution. It's not, it's not going to be easy, but the stakes are high. He says right there the two sides of the coin. You're so precious. You're so important. The mercy of God is being poured out. I'm begging you to accept it. If you don't, if you make your an enemy of the go self an enemy of the gospel, it's a rather horrible place to be. Uh, so that, he says that there, and now he's beginning to talk about how it's going to play out. You know, when he, he says not a hair of your head will be harmed, well, even if they shave your head, it, it, you're still safe for eternal life if you persevere in courage and in faith. And it's going to say it's going to be severely tested for some of you. He says here, you're going to be dragged before courts, you're going to be thrown into prison, some of you are going to be put to death, some of you are going to have to witness your children being put to death first. You know, they're going to do everything they can to make you recant your faith for some of you. But he says, I'll give you the grace to persevere if you'll make that the decision of your will. Okay? Let me get back to this till the age of the Gentiles. Yes. What? Have I run out of time? I'm going to go a couple more minutes. <laughs> I'm, at a, I'm at a crescendo moment here. I... <laughs> Trampled down until the the Gentile, by the Gentiles until their time is complete. I'm just saying that and letting it sit because I want it. I want you to think about it. That's where we are. That's where we are. After 70 AD, the church, the kingdom of God, is primarily made up of Gentiles. Right? Yeah. The, the age of the Gentiles, but it also insinuates that it's going to be an end to that age. Just as there was a close to the age of anticipation, the old covenant, there's going to be an end to the current age of the Gentile church as well. You remember when we did Romans, what chapter 11 was about? This, this is Paul. Chapter 11 says, I'm going to tell you something that everybody doesn't know. That at the end of this age, one of the big signs of the second coming is that there's going to be a great falling away from the church of the Gentiles and a great conversion amongst the Jews. So that the age of the Gentiles, and Paul 
Paul rebukes the Gentile believers sometimes thinking, yeah, God's cut the Jews off and now he's chosen up. He said, they are, I've always been the chosen people. You have an opportunity to be in, but don't be snubbing your nose at them. Because I'm telling you, a time is going to come where all the promises will be complete. And here, it kind of refers to that a little bit. The age of the Gentiles is going to come to an end. Then he says, he's still talking. But before that happens, the end, the age of the Gentiles ends, there will be signs in the sun and moon and stars. On earth, nations in agony, bewildered by the turmoil of the ocean and its waves. Men fainting away with terror and fear at what menaces the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things, now he's obviously talking about the end, right? He switched, he's, he's, he's switched gears, right? When these things begin to take place, you stand erect, hold your heads high, because your liberation is near at hand. So these cosmic things, and I, I tell you, you think, well, how can all that happen? One good asteroid would do all of that. For real. You know, there's 10,000 known asteroids, and they only record the ones that are bigger than a football field in our solar system. Now, we clocked over 10,000 about three years ago. They predict there's 100,000 of them. Y you know, and they're flying around. W what would happen if an asteroid the size of a football field, and you know, we've had them hit. One hit in Siberia in the early part of the 20th century, right? You know about that. But that was a desolate area. What, ha what would happen if it landed in Manhattan? Or it landed just off the coast of Manhattan and you had a tsunami. What would happen if it broke up on the way down and the big chunk hit, but thousands of smaller pieces of debris came flying down, flaming? I mean, it would just look just like revelations. The stars are falling and the, and the, the moon turns red. And the sky is blotted out because it's nuclear night, right? And this thing hits and puts up a cloud that blots out the sun for days at a time. It's all... It's not hypothetical. I mean, computer models say that's exactly what it would look like. You know? So it's not that far out that you don't have to say, oh, this is just mystical language about what's going to be symbolically going on. It could be quite literally. Now, what he's trying to say is that if you are witness of those events and everybody's freaking out because GPS won't work, I can't call Grandma in California and find out if she's okay, phones don't work, radar doesn't work, my, my, my satellite TV doesn't work, you know, the magnetic waves alone have messed all that up, and our reliance on technology will make us even more vulnerable. You know, the electrical grid goes down. You know, it'll be a mess. And you, can't, you don't know what's going on, right? Pandemonium. He says, when these things happen, everyone else is going to be freaking out, but you don't. Stand up erect and be happy. <laughs> if you can, be happy. Go ahead, Missy. Heaven. If, if it was Almighty God who set these planets and all stars in motion the way they are now, He can move them. Right, but what I'm saying, to, the, it, they don't, we don't actually have to see stars move around. I mean, actually, like they're just being moved around, or or, or actual a real star falling to Earth. That we now know that. That's, I mean, if it got within 100,000 miles of it, it would burn us up first anyway, right? I mean, these are massive balls of gas, and, they, they're, and they're hundreds of thousands or millions of miles away. But they didn't know that. To them, a meteor shower looked like stars falling. It's exactly the way they would have described it. We had the Perseids, and I hated it, it was too cloudy that night. On the, the 14th at 2 o'clock in the morning, the annual Perseid meteor shower, they said there were 100 an hour. <laughs> I couldn't see any of them because it was so cloudy. But I mean, but to the ancients, if you were out that night on a clear night and here come the Perseid meteor shower, you'd be going, whoa, the stars are falling, right? And some of them even blow up, you know, or, or some of them maybe even impact the ground and that kind of stuff. It was the way they described what these events and the way they could, the words that they had. And I'm just saying if we just take a minute to look at it, it's not that far-fetched. It's not that far-fetched. 
And maybe it'd be some comfort no one has predicted. Maybe if that happens, you know, we can say, well, thank goodness we're not being dragged into court and we don't have to persevere and we don't have to be eaten by lions. And maybe we won't see this either. But I mean, having been told ahead of time should be helpful. And when everyone else is freaking out, will we have the courage to say, relax? It's going to be okay. Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> and they'll say, you religious nut. Come get in this bomb shelter while there's still time. All right. One more line and I'm going to finish this section. Watch yourselves. In, in other words, in the meantime, in the meantime of all of this, the destruction of Jerusalem, then the age of the Gentiles, then the end of the world, in the meantime, watch yourselves or your hearts will be coarsened by debauchery and drunkenness and the cares of life and that day will come upon you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come down on all those living on the face of the earth. Obviously he's not talking about the destruction of Jerusalem now. Also he's not telling the people at the end time events to run to the hills. What good would that do you? You can separate these. I mean, he's not telling people at the second coming to run to the hills. And he's not telling the people that the destruction of Jerusalem that everyone on the face of earth is going to know about this. The Aztecs had no idea that, or the Incas or the American Indians, they had no idea what was going on. This was not a global event. It was a local one. But it was tremendous significance for those that understood and saw it. Come on them like a trap, for it will come down on all those living on the face of the earth. Stay awake, praying at all times for the strength to survive all that is going to happen. And to hold your ground before the Son of Man. So whatever is going to happen in your day, wherever you are in this scenario that's going to go on for many centuries that he's just described. Wherever you are in it, you will have your set of challenges to face for what's, what's going on in that chapter. He said, be prayerful, be vigilant, pay attention, know the big picture and where we plug into it, we in the Gentile church of the age of the Gentiles, right? And then we'll be okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For God, some of this is pretty tough. And we're not smart enough to really be able to package it properly or exactly know what to do with it. We're going to do the best we can and we're going to pray for your consolation and your wisdom to help it end up being sorted out in our minds and in our hearts exactly the way it's supposed to be. It's good news, the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you for telling us about it through the Gospels. In Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.